welcome to Chew On This. You are about to enter a discussion on how to actually live out faith in Christ in the reality of our messy lives. This discussion comes from our Wednesday night crew, the pastoral preaching notes, and the live large group discussion that these notes prompted. And last night it was quite the vigorous large group discussion. That was fun. This is something that we like to call a community-based learning experience. Come on, chew on this with us. Is it true that God really is not concerned with the everydayness of my life? Is he really only concerned with the things I actually do for him? Hmm. This is Pastor Orlean Hasseltine along with Pastor Robin Bjornsson. And we thank you so much for joining us for this session of Chew on This. This conversation was had live on Wednesday night, May 12th. And we are on lie number two in the series Summer of Lies, that God is not concerned with my everyday life, only the things I do for him. I want to let you know that all 30-some pages of notes are on our website, realchurch.org forward slash Wednesday night. And as always, I encourage you to go there, look, check out the commentaries, check out the references, and I guarantee you won't agree with all of them, but that's a good thing. We need to study, we need to think. I had a great time last night. We started out having a lot of, I don't know, maybe it was in the, in the weather, <laughs> Pastor Robin, because we had a, you know, a boondoggle of a, of a thunderstorm last night, and this was all before. We were making sure we got people out of here before it hit. Some of them actually stayed here until after it had gone by, but we got most of them out before it hit. And I don't know, maybe the, the, the barometric pressure, or there was just a lot of sweetness and goofing around, and one of our trustees was in fine form less last night, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. just enjoying it. It was just a lovely beginning of this conversation of we, we as a family. You talk about family codes, you need to go listen to the, the podcast on Ephesians, talking about what, it, what are the things that that are used to help define how your family will operate and work together and what is our priorities and how we handle things, those types of things. It was wonderful watching the sweetness of that just play out last night where there was a lot of goofing around before we started, going through you know, our prayer time, which is our worship time where we put up our prayer request and we and we pray. People still are not comfortable with that. I think I may end up going to see Jesus before I see people just relaxing into that. We're used to doing it maybe in a small group. But that's probably the biggest part in a small group study. But taking it into a large group format and not having actual music and all of that, that no, this is worship. So That was fun to to watch and see and then connecting people with, you know, all of the activities going on around here. But we began a little bit, I think, a little bit earlier than normal and just realizing there's going to be opportunity to share more examples and to dissect what seems like a really simple statement. But as we continue to go and, and talk, I could tell that there were just more examples needed because that just... God is not concerned with my everyday life, only the things I do for him. That kind of slaps you in the face like, well, that's not nice. Nice people don't do that. That's selfish. <laughs> but is it true? So it was lovely to step into three different concepts that I think come from this because it is interesting. Lies come from somewhere. Mm-hmm. And trying to identify what those look like because we're not going to get a t-shirt that says, God is not concerned with my everyday life, only the things I do for him, and declare that we believe that. What we're going to do is we're going to accept limitations and expectations that aren't true, that reference that. Now, you, you told me before we started the podcast that there was a thought that came, came to your mind last night as we are going through this about the idea of him not being concerned. Yeah. Yep. Exactly, yeah. One of the things that I was thinking about was just this idea of, you know, these lies, they don't just jump on us like a boogeyman on our back. Hey, I got you now. Got you. I got you now. <laughs> and, the ah. and, then, and then we can have a immediately reaction to that. Nope, they actually, uh, it's more subtle than that. So we, we pick up these lies somewhere along the course of our life. So that statement. They're either like, where, so asking questions of this lie, where'd this come oh. from? That's good. Where did yeah. this come from? Yeah. Um, was this 
a person that brought this into my life, whether intentioned or not intentioned. I mean, you know, sometimes we can be in an environment and think this is normal, and then we get out on our own and realize, no, that was only normal maybe in my family of origin. It's not really, other families don't function like that. Oh, really? Yeah. Big surprise, yeah. yes. right? Yeah. And That's the big surprise of going away to college. Oh, my goodness. Because you're leaving your family of origin and tasting other family codes, if you will. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 so even just you know poking and prodding these uh, lies that come up and being able to say okay where's this from, and for me this is a wonderful quiet time or prayer time with the Lord. So okay. yeah. I'm taking what you're sharing with us, Pastor O, into my quiet time, and I'm I'm. I don't know, decompressing with the Holy Spirit? You know, does this have any room in my life? If it does, how did it get here? Is there a person associated with this? Do I, is there like a voice associated with this? Um, was this something that I learned from my parents that they maybe unintentionally taught me um, that I need to continue loving my parents but release myself from this wrong thinking? Yes. I love when the Holy Spirit prompts us to slow down and think about what we're thinking. Yeah. Yes. Think about it. And, and what you're doing is you're making it reflect on Scripture. What is Scripture at? How does it line up to Scripture? Yes. Is it supported? And if it's not, oh, man, let's dump the baggage. Yes. Let's yes. dump the baggage. Because we know this. Extra baggage will hinder us. If you've mm -hmm. ever been in an airport with a really big suitcase and then another backpack and then a carry-on, you understand, yeah, give me one more bag that holds my skis or holds my sporting equipment and oh, expect me gosh. to... Yes. So they, you know, you can rent wheel dollies now to carry your stuff. Carry your stuff. But those extra baggages, baggages, extra bags that we hang around and take through our life really do have a cost. And there, that's where nobody, I love the um, encouragement to open every session in this series that we're not going to do any Q&A from the floor. You have questions, I enjoy them. We can talk about them afterwards. But because some of these hit a tender spot, for the safety of everyone, that tender spot needs to be handled in private before it becomes a public conversation. Because mm -hmm. sometimes our tender spots can spot out in ways that are not publicly appropriate. Mm -hmm. So just encouraging you too on our listening audience here on uh, Chew on This, that you are supposed to get irritated by the time we're done. And no, I don't know how many... <laughs> How many weeks will be on this topic? We did 16 on Ephesians, which still just floors me. Who knew? On such a little letter. Couldn't do that on Corinthians, which had two letters, much longer <laughs> conversation. But just taking the time to process, to look, and to ask, how is this? What is this? Where did it come from? Just like you were saying, I just love that statement. Where did it come from? Is it really there? And usually, I don't know, there's some things we can tell and we're, I know this is a problem. I know something is wrong. I got to figure out why this is, why do I do this all the time? Why am I always so immediately go to the negative with this situation or this topic or this person? It's not the topic nor the situation or the person. It's me taking a shortcut. So there has to be a reason why it hits that nerve. So that happens here with this topic as well, or with this series as well. We're expecting it. We're supposed to get agitated and it's supposed to poke around at things just to make sure, as my husband always says, he likes to push the chair you're sitting in. So as you recalibrate and try to get your balance, you grow. You grow. That's one of the family codes around here at Maranatha. You are going to grow. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the brilliance of Scripture. Yes, yes. I mean, you know, Scripture yes. isn't poking us. Mm -hmm. Is it Scripture we're reading? Yes, that's <laughs> right. Know? If it isn't just being nakedly truthful. Oh. You shouldn't do this. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it's wonderful because Scripture, once it's in you, it bounces around like this little tiny ping pong ball. And that's where sometimes when I can tell I get irritated at something, this isn't anything that's going on. This is a thing it's hitting in me. Right. And what is that? Yes. So here we go. God is not concerned with my everyday life, only the things I do for him. Because that is such a loaded statement and kind of phrased in a way that we'd automatically say, well, that's not nice. I broke it down into three different concepts, I think, that are easier for us to swallow, quote unquote, and checking out what scripture says about those three concepts. And then we can have the discussion, have I swallowed any of those three? And what do they look like in 
our world. The first concept is God is too big to be concerned with small things. The second concept is God is too busy to be concerned with the everyday. And the third concept is God is only concerned with the things that I do for him. That's what he's after in my life. So the the defining, the flip switching question I have found is, does this line up with the character of God that I know of him? Does it line up with the character of God that the people I trust as spiritually mature know of him? And I did bring this up, and I don't believe God is leading us to do this study again. And you'll understand why. Maybe we'll just do a podcast series, <laughs> Pastor Robin. Maybe we'll just do that. We spent some time years ago on Wednesday Night Crew examining the character of God. And like most series, I have a structure, I have material, I have curriculum, but it grows, it ebbs and flows as we go because, yay, Holy Spirit. And this one actually, <laughs> it ebbed and flowed into a three year series. Uh huh. We didn't have a podcast. Could you imagine a podcast? <laughs> <That's> the- <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh my goodness! Oh uh, yeah, that was interesting. Recall, that was a series on the on prayer. Mm-hmm. We were learning about prayer, and yes. I, I keep coming back to your statement: this is not about stained glass. Okay. Yes. You know, and, yes. and we learned about the character of God in that. It was great. Yes, and having this focus of you can expect this because it's His character. His character doesn't change. And one of the ways you can do that in your private worship life is looking up the names of God because that's what we did. We looked up the names of God because the names of God define a portion, a facet of his character, much like a diamond has many facets. His character is shown through the many facets and attributes that he has. We went through all of them of God the Father. We went through all of them through Jesus the Son. And then we went through all of them through about the Holy Spirit. So we would have an opus of study. And we had an opus of study. But if you, in this series, are looking for a positive support process to help you answer some of these questions, I can't encourage you enough to start looking up the character of God, the names of God. Start with the names of God and start reading where they're listed in Scripture and then start writing out a definition of what that looks like in a person's character and spend some time seeing there because if that character doesn't match up with something we know you're dealing with something that is a lie there's something I don't understand there's something I need help with and that is wonderful because you have people you can lean in and have conversations have you ever bumped into this what do you think of that I believe this but scripture says this what's going on do I have a problem etc etc so is it in within the character of God. So here we're looking at God is too big. He's just got so much going on to be concerned with small things. So we're going to look at quite a few scripture verses here at the beginning to help us make a decision if we think that is true or a lie, if it's truth or a lie. 1 Corinthians 1, 26, 28 says this, and all of the versions I'll be reading are ESV, unless I jump into the NLT and then I'll let you know. For considering your calling, brothers, not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful. And yeah, not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. So if you're going to look at this, God is too big to be concerned with small things, how would that portion of scripture influence your belief on that all right i i see it as he he likes the surprise you never thought this was going to affect you approach (laughs) he definitely likes to not follow what we embrace as worldly privilege or worldly knowledge or he wants you to see it as him so he removes all the distractions of what we say are us and he goes no this is me 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 28. Now, Judges 6, 14 through 16 shows us an example of one of the judges in the book of Judges, Judges 6, 14 through 16. Gideon is the young man being asked by God to do something big. And here is his response. And the Lord turned to Gideon and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? Now, keeping in mind that in this time in the nation of Israel, this portion of the tribe was being 
overran by the Midianites. I don't know what other word to really use. We we don't, well, maybe we can think of Russia and Ukraine in this. Mm-hmm. But they would come and they would, to the point where they didn't leave them not, not not even enough food to eat, but they would wreck all their fields and all their prospects for being able to grow grow food. And he comes to this person who is grinding grain in a wine press to try and hide it and trying to hide their food so the Midianites don't come and steal their food from them. So they're having this feeling of being weak and in secret and just trying to make things so their family can eat. And God is telling them to go stand up against this army that everybody is having a hard time, but especially this poorer tribe. And it says in verse 15, and Gideon responded, oh, oh, please, please, Lord, being respectful, how can I save Israel. Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. Well, there we go. I'm the weakest of the weakest clan, or the weakest tr- family in the, in the clan, and you're going to tell me that you're going to use me as one man to strike this blow to take out this entire nation. <laughs> um, God is too big to be concerned with the small things. Uh, no, I think he's using the small things to confound the big things. So let's go into John fifteen four. Here, uh, Jesus is creating a word picture for us to understand how our life in him works. And he says, abide in me and I in you. So he's asking us to live in him and he will live in us. Okay, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I understand that you need to be anchored in me in order to do the things that are now our family code. You need to be anchored in me to do the things that I've asked of you. I understand that without me, you can't do this. That I, quote unquote, owe you something, would you say? That I know I have something essential that you have to be tapped into. Yay, Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. That there is this, I get it. What I'm asking of you, I'm not asking of a mere human. What I'm asking of you, I'm asking of someone who is madly in love with me and has access to the power source. Mm -hmm. So this idea of he doesn't understand big and small, this tells me he definitely understands big and small. He understands what it takes to feed into the lifestyle that he's asking of us, if you will. Then he goes in, here we see Paul phrasing it in Romans 5, 7 through 9. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God, he actually shows his love for us, that while we were still sinners, not acceptable unto him because of the sin in our life, could not be in his presence, Christ died for us. Christ made the ultimate sacrifice when we were in our destitution. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more should we be saved by him from the wrath of God. So here we look at the very beginning of the bridge of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection begins in a small place, begins in a small place where the big came to create a place so the small could walk into the big, if you will. Once again, God is too big to be concerned with the small things. What does Romans 5, 7, 9 say? What did it say? And there is a quote out of Lies Men Believe by Morley and Wolgamuth. I have it, the type so small in my notes. Uh, but when you go to the website and access the notes, you can see the reference. But there's this wonderful quote in there where some of these ideas have come from. We have access four or five different resources to compile these lies that we can believe in what they look like and are doing our best to reword them to be applicable to today's society. But in there they say that God's bigness isn't the kind of bigness that overlooks smallness. Like, here I come! Whoa! This great big giant of a person and casting a shadow on everyone. Look at me, look at me, look how great I am. Here's my power. Worship me, worship me. It doesn't work like that. Rather, it's a bigness that 
encompasses the smallest, and I would actually say energizes and enables the smallest to do what it's supposed to do, to be its very best. Mm -hmm. So it is much like attaching an umbilical cord. Yes, maybe that's a female reference, but it's there. And here's going to be the the food. Here's going to be my life-giving force. I'm going to give this to you. So I realize you need this. So once again, it's God too big to be concerned with small things. Then... Maybe we could have started with this concept. I could tell last night when, when I brought it up that people were looking at me, hey, this doesn't make sense to what you just spoke about. But in my brain, it did. All right. When I've been working on this and praying over this and trying to figure out ways to put it into examples so we can all take a bite and realize, oh, yes, I can taste that. I realize how I am affected by this. There is this whole conversation, and it is really an intriguing study of Gnosticism, because Gnosticism has been around forever, because it's a lie, but it's interesting because it's still present in our everyday society, and we don't recognize it, because it's basically the worship of knowledge, that your value is equal to how much you know and where you get your knowledge from. Now, granted, there's mysticism attached to this as well, where some say the knowledge has come from unknown sources, and that we would call paganism or Satanism, depending on your point of view. <laughs> and so I'm wondering if this lie, if that this whole thing here, that God is too big to be concerned with the small things, or the bigger overarching lie that we're looking at, that God is not concerned with my everyday life, only what I do for him, if it's related to this idea that God is only concerned with what I know, how much knowledge I can put in my head and show in my actions. So, of course not. Of course he's not. But I, I have to wonder, I have to wonder if this is where this type of stuff has come from. Now, here's just a quick overview. And there's so many tendrils when it comes to Gnostic belief. I'm just going to give a very general, ge general outline to support my question. Does this smell of Gnosticism? Okay, the physical world is bad in Gnosticism. It doesn't do anything. There's the whole line that believes you're supposed to um, torture it and, and get it out of you, and they would whip themselves, and they would starve themselves and do all this, because the physical world, you don't spend any money. You just, the physical world is bad, so you don't do anything related to it. And then there's the other half who says the physical world is bad, that you, know, that you contain it, and you you control it. There we go. The physical world is bad, so you control it and you keep it away from you. That's one thought of Gnosticism. But then there's this other one. The physical world is worthless. So who cares what you do in the physical world? The only thing that matters, the only thing that matters is how much you know and what you've learned. <laughs> Sorry. You like my picture? You like that picture? No. I'm immediately going to the sexual revolution of the 60s. Mm -hmm. You know, what you do with your body doesn't matter. Yeah. Was the lie. Yes. Yes, and it we affects have, yourself. And we yeah. have what? Is it, what is the book today? You know, the body keeps score. We're yes. learning yes. that oh. what we do in the body. Yes. I mean, so science is catching up with the spirit. Yes, and blowing up some of these lies. Anyway, yes. a little sidetrack, but it's like it, yes, an, an example of narcissism. Not mm. necessarily in our day today, but in the '60s, that was part of the flavor of it. All oh, what you do with your body doesn't matter. Free love, blah 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 blah. Not realizing you're opening the door. Yes, because that's a lie. Yes. Sorry. Yes. What? Well, I, yeah. Highly recommend that book for anyone. Listen to it if you if you don't like to read because it's it helps you understand what the phrase "fearfully and wonderfully made" means. That how we have been created, it helps you believe in that, whether you believe in a creator or not. Mm -hmm. Because, honey, child, we have DNA, and DNA is just code. It is computer code. And the big question: This isn't one I invented. I I heard some speakers read some books. Where did the code and the DNA come from. If we know how hard it is to create code to run computer world, where did our human code come from? Who put that in our DNA? What are the odds of that just randomly happening? Anyway, that's another conversation. Mm -hmm. One I am not well studied enough to even have beyond that wonderful sentence. So yes, does this smell of Gnosticism? So the word Gnosis means knowledge and that's where this worship of knowledge comes from. So, there's many strands of this belief, but here, here are some overviews. Um, Gnostic texts often describe God as incomprehensible, unknowable, and transcendent. All right? That God cannot be observed with our senses, not easily grasped with our understanding, that he is so amazingly weird. He's even outside of deity. He's beyond that. They call him the ultimate ground of being. 
God is superior to deity. They call him the ultimate ground of being, being with a capital B, who resides in this divine realm. Now, there are smaller deities that created the earth and did all these other things, created the material world. Because God is so amazing, he wouldn't even do that. He wouldn't create the material world. Okay? So humans are split between the physical and spiritual world. I get where that comes from, that the true human self is as alien to the world as is the transcendent God. So we really don't relate to this human world. World, It's not, so I know, if your brain's spinning, go ahead and let it spin. I'm just giving this overview so we can, all right, so this belief system has been here for a long time, and it's been proven heresy and proven a lie, and there's all kinds of information. I've listed some in my notes, but that our human soul is naturally divine, therefore that's all we need to take care of our knowledge and everything. We don't have to take care of any of the material stuff. The physical body is a prison. It's not important. That there's this divine spark that comes with knowledge and it frees that within humans and it allows that piece of us to return to where where, um, the ultimate ground of being resides. Okay, so. uh (laughs) Uh-huh. And salvation is initially brought about by gnosis, by knowledge. And the long-term result is that spark that's in us goes back to where the ultimate being is, who is not concerned concerned at all with this world. Now, we know from the book of Revelation that God is concerned with this world because this world is changed into the eternal world at the end. Do your best to read through the book of Revelation and realize there's only a few facts listed. There's only a few facts listed. A lot of it is prophetic, and therefore, you can say, this is what I think it means. You can't say, this is what it means. So it is interesting. All of this is residing in the woo-woo-woo-woo-woo. But what is interesting is there is this connection with this idea. This material world is just so every day that God can't be concerned with it. It would actually be against his character to be concerned with this. And I would say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I think you're missing a huge portion of God's character when you say that. And you have fallen in love with this lie that the only thing that is important, and therefore I'll structure my life and the people in my life and how I honor people and how I uphold people and how I deal with people and how I respond to people and how I interact with people and how I honor people is all based on how much they know. Does that sound familiar to anybody? That is a lie, and it's not the heart of God. And this, God is too big to be concerned with small things. I believe that is rooted in Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. It's at the heart of that whole process. Mm -hmm. There's examples in Scripture of Gnostic belief. Acts 8 talks about Simon the magician. 1 Timothy 1 talks about Hymenius and Philetus. And Acts 6 and Revelation 2 talks about the uh, Nicolaitans. And those are all different types of Gnostic sects. And you can go, if you want to, read in my notes and see where they are mentioned and who brought them up. And our church forefathers who were around this stuff, who left notes about, especially about Simon the magician in Acts chapter 8, about the cost. And some people attribute this whole burgeoning Gnostic belief to him, starting it where he could be, quote unquote, the Messiah of this. Because he was basically showing himself off to be the Messiah to the Samaritans. And so when Philip shows up and then Peter and Paul show up and all of this, then, or Peter and John show up, then there's this process of chaos. And he then wants that power. So there's a whole conversation and yes of course there's an argument about whether he really got saved or what 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 but i want to let you know gnosticism has been around for a very long time most of the commentaries say it was here before jesus and that makes perfect sense because it's the worship of self-aggrandizement which is the core sin of satan got him kicked out of heaven and where he is today so this idea that i can own knowledge knowledge is power And it trumps everything else, everything else dim, so I don't have to pay attention to it, take care of it, or honor it, or respect it. Yeah. Concept number two. God is too busy. He's a busy man. (laughs) He's a busy man taking care of his stuff to be concerned with everyday things. So if we believe God is not concerned with my everyday life, we're buying into this one. He's just too busy. So I would like to propose a study in Scripture that says the everyday is part of what God uses. Here, the wedding at Cana, 
in John chapter 2 is the only gospel that this miracle is listed in. And that is very intriguing because John only goes through the trouble of listing seven of them. Remember, Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written before this, and so was Q, the source where they came from. And John only lists seven, and so he's writing to add what he knows. He was asked, actually, to write this after the book of Revelation, and I believe the first in his three letters. I think this is the last thing he wrote. And they said to fill in the spaces. That's my wording. Read through Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then you add your add yours because of his relationship with Jesus. And he was the youngest apostle, so he had a different view. So all of this stuff, all of these miracles listed in here are there for this very, very, very specific reason. And this one is listed here because of its power to transform. And the power to transform is actually rooted in everyday life. Because you start with the everydayness and you transform it into what God needs it to be or what God not needs it to be, what God has created it to be. So it realizes its full potential. So here we go. There's this wedding in Cana and Mary, Jesus's mom, is invited. So the question is relatives? Maybe chances are because she was very concerned about this. So they're thinking they're connected to these people. And Jesus and the disciples that he had at the time were invited. And that would have been, I have a list. The disciples, there's Andrew, the analytical one who I think was the producer of the whole group, <laughs> and Peter, Philip, Nathaniel, and John was around. So we're thinking possibly John since he put this in his, what he wrote in the gospel. Now, they're there, and Mary comes up to him and says, Hey, son, I, I want you to notice that they are running out of wine, and I would like you to do something about it. She really doesn't ask him to do anything according to scripture. She says, Jesus, they have no wine. And he looks at her and said, I'm woman, not as a reprimand, but as a term of endearment, woman. What does that have to do with me? Pray tell. <laughs> My hour has not yet come. So I kind of wonder what conversations Jesus and his mom had, what things Mary seen that happened in Jesus's youth that none of us have access to that information. And the rest of the conversation isn't listed because in verse 5 it says that Mary then went to the servants and said, do whatever he tells you. So here he is letting her know, Mom, if I start this miracle working time clock, the timing of when my death comes has now been started. Do you want me to start it now or do you want me to wait a year? What would you like me to do? I mean, that kind of conversation. I'm not saying that's the conversation they had, my imagination, but that kind of conversation. If it starts now, we're going to start the journey to the end of my human life here on this planet. And she tells the servants to do whatever Jesus tells you to do. So there are these huge six stone jars filled with water that the servants of this family filled early in the cool of the day. They already had them full, and they're empty because there's all these people there. Everybody, everyone in the community is invited to the weddings. Weddings are a community event, and it's one of the ways you show that you love your community. By you save, you work, you barter, you do what you need to do to provide not just a meal, but most of these events lasted for a week. You in, in provide for the whole festivities of this week. It creates this sense of community and, and larger family and you're all together and you get in those petty arguments that you get when you're with people for a week doing things and, and you apologize and you learn and you laugh and you enjoy, you get all caught up with everything. So they are a, a really important structure. They're not like how we do weddings here in the West. They're very important structure and a beautiful thing and they need to be respected and honored as that. So if you run out of food or run out of wine, it is basically saying, you guys suck, I don't care, go home. And it's not because the host family is filled with introverts, all right? <laughs> I don't need you to be fulfilled. I need to go recharge alone. And you've taken all my energy. Go home at least for 24 hours. Come back next, you know, the next day. No, it wasn't seen as anything like that. It was communicating to them, you don't have value. I haven't adjusted my life to show that you have value. Actually, I don't really care if you're here or not. I mean, that type of disrespect and dishonor, that family would have never been 
the same in that community. They would have all, basically, they would have been outcast. Mm -hmm. Their children would not marry your children. Their children would not play with your children. They would not protect or take care of you because you've already proven you do not care for the tribe. You do not care for the family. Mm -hmm. So there is this huge, huge consequence to running out of wine. So Jesus sees these six stone jars and he realizes there's many days yet to come. There's many days yet to come. So if we're going to do this, let's take care of it and do it. Get these huge, and they figure it's about 100 gallons of water. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot. There's a lot of people there. And so he tells the servants to go fill them again, and it's not during the cool of the day. And I'm sure the servants were really excited. We already did that, but they <laughs> did it. So I have to wonder what they knew of Jesus. They knew of Jesus probably as a rabbi, as a teacher, that he was up and coming, per se, that he was a person that they respected. They did this. Now, it isn't known to the family as much, or it isn't known to the master of ceremonies who is running the event. So he says, fill them, bring them here. He doesn't do anything to them. He doesn't add anything to them. He doesn't go around and anoint them with oil, according to what we know in Scripture. He just tells them to go ahead and open one of the jugs, fill a, a cup with the liquid that's there, and go give it to the master of ceremonies to See what he thinks of the new quote-unquote wine Jesus just made. There's nothing in the jugs but water. I pity the servants who had to fill that cup, the cup bearer, whoever that person was. I know we're not talking about a king here, but the person who had to walk in there with the cup and say, hey, take a sip of this, man. Tell me what you think of this vintage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was just water 30 minutes ago. <laughs> and was it water when he drew it out? Well, Did it change along the way? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. You know what I mean? This servant who, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I, uh, between verses four and six in the story of the wedding at Cana that you're talking about here, Pastor O, um, uh, John tells us a little while later in John five, I think there was a quick prayer. I think there was quick communication because, uh, in verse, uh, let's see, John five nineteen, it says, And Jesus gave them this answer. He's talking to others. Very truly, I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees the Father doing, because whatever the Father does, the Son does also. So there had to have been quick communication. His mom tells him this. Um, I think he prays, yes. has a conversation with yes. Dad. Yes. Are we starting the timeline? We're starting the what, 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 what? what about this family? Yes. yes. And so I'm seeing the, the activity of the Holy Spirit, yes. the activity of the Father, and the activity of the Son all happening to love this family. Yes. How cool. And we know it wasn't on Jesus' spreadsheet of the timeline of right. his life, exactly. his messianic experience. Mm -hmm. It didn't say start with the wedding. Right. Because he had... Like a great point. I love your brain and the rest of you. I just said, yeah. <laughs> all right. So here we go, and there's this. And the master of ceremonies says, everyone serves the good wine first. When people have drunk freely, freely, then the poor wine. That makes sense. But you've kept this amazing good wine until now, at which point the servant, who claps, okay? <laughs> I'm not going to die today. <laughs> and this, verse 11, is the first of his signs. Jesus' march to the cross now begins. Mm. So let me ask, is he too busy to be concerned with our every day? The reputation of this family and the legacy of this family was altered by Jesus' interaction. It was not on his to-do list. It's interesting, some of the after effects also, the respect the individuals had for Jesus' mom in that area I believe had to adjust, especially from the disciples seeing their relationship. Also, it increased, it says in scripture that the disciples now believed in him. This seeing, I have to wonder how many conversations they had about why did he bother? Who are these people? What is the significance of him doing such a major transformation miracle in such a small non-known, you know, raising somebody from the dead is much more valuable. Why don't you use your power for something big like that? This isn't even a footnote on the billboard of Jesus is the Messiah. So 
So they have the party, last for a week, and it says at the end of John 2, this is another point, he not only does this crazy personal everyday miracle for a family, it says in John 2, 12, after this he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. Hmm. Why is that listed? They went and chilled, had a break, recollected themselves, hung out, went swimming, had a picnic, played Game some picnic. baseball, mm -hmm. you know. So Jesus lived as a son and as a brother and as the Messiah. So I don't think we can at all embrace that God is too, be, too busy to be concerned with their everyday life. He lived that concern when he was here on the planet. So God is not concerned with my everyday life, only the things I do for him. Con uh, concept number one, God is too big to be concerned with the small things. Concept two, God is too busy to be concerned with the everyday. And now we're going to look at this third concept that is part of that lie. God is not only concerned, God is only concerned with the things that I do for him. Really what he's after is my obedience. Obedience. He wants me to do the things that are listed in scripture. At whatever cost? If that is his only focus, whatever he does to motivate us to get us there doesn't matter. Because what he is concerned with is our action and not the process that gets us to action. We're going to be looking now at some other people in Jesus' life who were part of his ministry life. And that is Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. I find this an interesting study because there's so much unknown about their relationship, but intriguing, intriguing the role they played. We meet them, we meet them in Luke 10, but we can tell by the verses here and how the things go, there's a relationship already. There's something that's already been established. So here in Luke 10, now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. So, is this the first meet and greet? I'm getting the feeling it is not, that she knows, disciples knows, they've heard him, and she has, I have place, come, you can have, you can come here, because Jesus does not have a home at this point. He can go back to his mom and brother's home, but he doesn't have his own home, and so this is a place where Jesus can teach and train and be, as well as go recuperate and take some time off for whatever he needs, private prayer and all of that. So he can use their home. So has he used it already? I don't know. But it's interesting that it says into her house, not into her brother Lazarus's house or anything like that. She's welcoming him as the leader of her home into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. That sentence tells me that this has been going on. They're part of the people. They are part of his close circle of intimate friends. And Martha was distracted with much serving because it's a lot of work to host. Oh, let's go with a group of 15. And we know now from our other example about the wedding that hospitality is part of how you take care of your community. And by the way, it hasn't changed. We just don't do it in Western culture. <laughs> we entertain. We don't do hospitality. So Martha was distracted with much serving, and she's like, okay, Jesus. And so for her to come up to Jesus and say, okay, Jesus, come on. Don't you care that Mary's sitting here being a slug? Tell her to get off her little orphan Annie and get in the kitchen and help me and I need her tell her to help me she's left me to serve alone this isn't fair but Jesus looked at her the very fact that she came to the teacher while he's teaching and said this you don't do this in Eastern culture this is a big unknown uh, so we know there's a different dynamic happening in this house <laughs> that Mary could do that I mean, she could have been banned from their visible presence for the rest of her life by the patriarch of the family who's so embarrassed by her obtuseness to think she has enough value to go interrupt the rabbi while he's teaching. Matter of fact, Mary shouldn't be sitting at his feet in the first place. She's a female. All right, so here we go. And Martha's like, come on. So all of the dynamics of the story are just inside out for that culture. And so Martha is saying this, and Jesus goes, oh, Martha, I know it's important. But Mary is choosing the greater thing right now, the most important thing. He's cho she's chosen the good portion. She's, she's doing what is right. Don't take that away from her. What in the world did Martha see that as? 
But you talk about Jesus being concerned <laughs> with what I do for him. Martha's doing the do and Mary's just sitting around learning the learn. So he could have said, Mary, get in there and do what you're supposed to do to take care of this event. But he didn't. He didn't. He corrected Martha. And yes, this was an outburst. She needed to do something because Martha is wound as a doer. We had a raise of hands last night. How many of us find worshiping Jesus a list to do and I love Jesus and I do this and I just get it done and hands go up. And Jesus is saying, that's great and fine. We need that. But this right here, this is more important that you know who I am and you understand my teaching, that you have relationship with me. So they are creating this new culture, new family values, new family code while Jesus is here. Paul comments that on a lot in his writings. And we're looking at Jesus being there and teaching the code by example and by being in their everyday life. And then he is also realigning what is important to do. Sometimes the do is to just pause and be with them. There was a wonderful woman of God, uh, Dr. Deborah Gill, who I he I've heard her speak many times. And she tells the story, I believe it's when she was getting her doctorate. And she was at the college and she was working on something. And all of a sudden, in her private worship time, she had this Holy Spirit experience. And did I tell you she's working on her doctorate? And she's supposed to be in class somewhere and she can't get off the floor because of this amazing. So does it count to go to your professor and say, well, I was going to be here, but the Holy Spirit fell and I couldn't get out of the room. All right, so she gave up that day and it, it was hours. <clears throat> the next day, it happened again. And the next day, it happened again. And it was a chunk of time. I'm, I, it's one week or two weeks. I can't quite remember. One week just sounds more manageable. But no matter what, she missed all the stuff she was supposed to do during that week. What was God pouring into her that was going to be required? What was happening? Was it, it just this sweetness of relationship and love? I don't know. I'm not sure she really even knows. I'm sure she's probably made some connections because this was a long time ago. And just this amazing experience of being there. And he wasn't asking her to do anything. It was just this soaking in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Where does that fall on the to-do? That if he is only concerned with what I do for him, wouldn't he put that in us as we sleep so we could just be more effective? That sounds very Western. Dump it in me while I'm sleeping. Recharge my spirit as well as my physical body, and I can be more effective for you, Jesus. But something about the awake conscious mind needed to be participating. There was relationship building that had nothing to do with doing anything. So I loved that. It's funny how testimonies just stick in your head. So here, there's Dr. Gill having a Mary experience at the cost of whatever was going to happen with college and how God used that as a moment in time to just embrace and love her, not asking her to do anything. So here we have this going on with back to Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. We don't have a last name, and I'm not going to call them the Olsons because the Olsons or the Joneses or the Johnsons don't work in that culture. <laughs> they had a different last name or a surname, however their names are listed in Eastern culture. But here, then something happens. Those of you who are familiar with this portion of Scripture realize that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus show up in a really big way. Lazarus isn't really mentioned until here towards the end of his life in resurrection. Yes, I said resurrection. And we find in John 11 that Lazarus was sick. And they sent word to where Jesus was and said, the one you love is sick. And your dear friend is very, very sick. And the disciples don't see Jesus making headway to go see him. Because, you know, Mary and Martha seen Jesus raise two people from the dead. They had died and he raised them from the dead right then and there. And, or within hours. So, you know, the critics were saying they weren't really dead. But, all right. So they knew this and they were like, oh, so Lazarus is really sick now. We asked the master to come. We can't take care of it with normal means. We now need supernatural help. And Jesus didn't show up.
he didn't show up. He didn't come. And they're worried and panicked and something big must have happened to him. And the disciples are just watching Jesus camp. He's not doing anything. He says, we're not going yet. He explains it to them. They don't understand. I wouldn't understand. Robin, would you understand? Not a bit. Not a bit. What's going on? So he waits for two whole days. So that's Jesus and the disciples waiting for two whole days. Well, Mary and Martha have buried their brother who died without Jesus showing up. What kind of questions do you have about your relationship with Christ in that? Can we even call it a situation? That trauma. We've done all this. We love him. We know they have this relationship. We know he's the Messiah. What in the world is going on? He never even showed up. I, I don't I don't get it. And I'm sure other people in their world, not in their family, but around them have died in these years that they've known Jesus, of course, and knowing that, well, maybe Lazarus was supposed to die. I don't know. And you know the things you do to try to make sense of things you don't understand when the supernatural is involved and you want God to do something and he hasn't. And is that part of just being a human being? And blah, blah, all the things are going through their head. So they bury him in the 24 hours of dealing with the sorrow. And Jesus still has not showed up. Because I'm sure when he died, they figured, well, he can still show up because we've seen him raise the dead. But he has been taken care of, put in the tomb. The tombstone has been put in place. And he's been in there for four days. What were those four days like for these sisters? I thought he was concerned with our every day. I thought Lazarus was important to him. They didn't know what Jesus was up to. The disciples could barely tell what Jesus was up to because they didn't want to go back to Bethany because they knew once they went there that they were going to be in trouble and arrested and they're going to die because Jesus is a wanted man. And if they go there and it's Thomas who says, well, let's just go with him, guys. Let's go die with Jesus. Seriously, that's the statement he makes here in John 11. So Jesus shows up, and Martha is the first one to come see him. They both know he's there. The teacher is coming. And she says, Master, you are finally here. I'm sure he could see the confusion on her face. And he talks to her about the resurrection, and she said, Yes, I believe you can raise people with you on the, on the day. You've taught us about this. And then he refers to it as, I'm looking for it. Your brother will rise again. And Martha says here in verse 24, he will rise when everyone else rises on the last day. And Jesus tells her this, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Martha knew Jesus was challenging her to a new level of faith. Asking her, can I take care of this situation? Do you believe I love you? Do you believe I love Mary? Do you believe I love Lazarus? Can you remember all that we've done, our relationship, the intimacy of it and the beauty of it, that it's going to affect what's going on now? I'm sure Martha had no, she knew he raised two people from the dead and the other things that aren't listed in scripture. And she tells him, yes, Lord, I've always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God the one who has come into the world from God. I don't know what you're up to, Jesus, but I know you're him. That faith to make that statement. She didn't ask him to do anything. He didn't tell her he was going to do anything. He asked her for faith in her everyday life. She goes and gets Mary. <laughs> the teacher is here and wants to see you. So Jesus wants to speak to Mary before he goes to the tomb. Mary comes and is not quite so controlled. She arrived and saw Jesus and said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. What's the matter with you? I know she said that. He loves her. When Jesus saw her weeping, and then all of the people that were at the house with them, the, the, the community keeners, everybody came for this. This was an important family in in the community, everybody is there, and they are crying, and he was deeply responsive. His emotions of watching the power of death in agony and knowing he is here for this reason, to conquer death. And what's going to be happening in the next few minutes is going to be taking and putting it on the, the, the quick the quick track to happening, and it's going to speed everything up. And he knows this piece 
Because Lazarus is going to be a walking billboard of the power of God, the power of the Messiah in this world. And he knows it's going to speed up and he knows his death is imminent. What he is going to do. This part he knows. He has the cheat sheet for this. He knows what he's supposed to be doing. And he sees them and he is overwhelmed by their sorrow. And it says that this is where Jesus wept. Then Jesus wept watching their sorrow. I think Jesus wept watching the power of death and how it affects us. He wept over our everyday life and what it's like to be human. He didn't have to cry, but allowing himself to be attached. He wasn't a detached God, a detached. He's a person bonded with them in their everyday life. Then he goes and tells them, <laughs> tells Martha to have the stone. They get to where the tomb is. Martha, tell him to roll the stone away. Um, <clears throat> it's been four days, Jesus. <laughs> four days. Practical Martha. One, two, uno, dos, tres, cuatro. One, two, three, four. He's going to stink. And I'm sure Jesus just looked at her and smiled. And she goes, okay, you're the Messiah. Roll the stone. Rolls the stone. I got to wonder... If their olfactory senses were overwhelmed at this point, or if Lazarus was already in a resurrected state. Because remember, Lazarus is in heaven. He's in the spiritual realm. His body is dead and decaying. And up there, did they say, you're only here for a few days. Enjoy yourself. We're sending you back. And Lazarus like, oh, no, you ain't. <laughs> we ain't doing that. I mean, this whole thing. I mean, there's other things happening outside of everyday life in the spiritual realm as this going. But so when they rolled away the stone that just came to me last night in the group, did they smell death? Was it there? I'm kind of thinking it wasn't. And they would all go. Oh. And then Jesus commands Lazarus. He doesn't ask him. He says, Lazarus, come out. And he comes out bound in these death clothes, the the. I can't say embalming wraps, but it was their death process wrap. So they un unwrap him. And from that moment on, society went insane because they all knew he was dead, dead. He wasn't just dead. He was dead, 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 dead to kind, dead, dead to king, dead. And here Jesus comes and he orchestrates the scenario so the resurrection of Lazarus can happen. And here is where we come to a close on this concept. This thing just really nailed me. I tell you, I love when you're reading scripture and it just comes in and it just opens up this process. I have to wonder if we don't want to believe this lie, but we like to believe this lie that God really isn't concerned with my everyday life because he is. If he is, then I need to really trust God like Lazarus, Mary, and Martha trusted God. I have to trust God to do things in the hard and the impossible and the uncomfortable and the not not this world easy. He's going to want something Lazarus-y like of me. He's going to want something Mary-ish of, of me. I want something Martha-ish of me. And I have to wonder if the equation to get to this kind of stuff in our world comes from God being involved in proving himself faithful in our everyday life. So Martha could look at him and say, I know you're the Messiah, and right now that's it. I know you're the Messiah. End of story. My brother's dead. You're here. You're the Messiah. Do what you got to do. Can I do that? I don't think that comes without Jesus being in our everyday life. So I would say this isn't just a lie. This is an insidious lie mm -hmm. that has tendrils into Satanism. Mm -hmm. That when we can start believing this lie, it is the first step, first step down that slippery slope, the first step into that darkness, the first step of heading towards God is not fill in the blank. No, God is very concerned with our everyday life. He created humankind for fellowship. He created us, not fellowship with just one another, fellowship with him. And not just when we get into the supernatural, but while we were here as well. He has shown it all through scripture. I want to not just be your father. I want to be with you. I want to be with you. So my question as we close today's podcast is can I do it? Can I let Jesus be in my every day knowing that that's building the blocks of faith that will be asked of me as I'm on this journey with them here in my everyday life? Thank you for joining us on today's discussion on lie number two, 
God is not concerned with my everyday life, only the things I do for Him, and how we busted that in this series of the Summer of Lies. Please join us and the whole Wednesday night crew at Maranatha's Forest Lake Campus at 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday evenings, and you'll get a chance to enjoy all of this material live. Don't forget, you can check out our website, realchurch.org forward slash Wednesday night for all of Pastor Orlean's notes and references. And today, wherever we find ourselves, let's love God and love people. See you for the next Chew on this episode.